membership of wildlifers. Uh, for conservation, share a common interest that is wildlife and its conservation. Willing to work with the 119 year old organization Rotary towards uh, building a future in which people and nature thrive. To share a few uh, notes about our uh, fellowship group, we are a group of around 600 plus interested individuals who have globally united around uh, a common uh, interest with the primary purpose to network and uh, further friendship. Although our fellowship activities are conducted independent of uh, Rotary International, they are in harmony with the Rotary uh, policies. Our purpose is to create awareness about importance of wildlife to promote lasting friendships outside one's own club, district and country, and to promote locally, regionally and globally that conservation of living resources are important to humans and future generations to enjoy our natural world and the incredible species that live within it. A Rotary Club is a member of Rotary International and a Rotary Fellowship is a group of like-minded individuals driven by Rotarians beyond their clubs. Today, we have invited members of Rotary Clubs and friends of Rotary from different parts of the world for this meeting. A hearty welcome uh, to one and all. And uh, on behalf of the wildlifers, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished uh, speaker, Mr. Saad Bin Jung, uh, who will be introduced by our friend, Rotarian Jahan Ara. Uh, over to you, Jahan. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. So very good morning and good evening, dear Rotarians. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you Saad Bin Jung, a multifaceted personality. He's of royal descent, a former cricketer, an author, owner of a safari lodge, and a wildlife conservationist. Saad Bin Jung is a former Indian cricketer who played first class cricket from 1978 to 1984. His maternal grandfather is none other than Nawab Muhammad Iftikhar Ali Khan Patauri, a distinguished cricketer who captained the Indian cricket team. Saad is now a conservationist and lives in his village of Mangala near Bandipur in Karnataka, while his children manage his wildlife resort, the bison on the Kabini River. Saad was born into the Paiga family of Hyderabad state and the royalty of Bhopal and Patauri. He grew up in Hyderabad. Saad was selected just after his 18th birthday to play his first class debut match for India under 22 against the touring West Indians in November 1978. He was selected for an Indian board president's 11 against the West Indians later in the season and also against the Pakistan touring team early the next season. He played the Dulip Trophy matches for South Zone in 1979-1980. His innings of note in 1979-80 was 136 not out in seven hours, batting for Hyderabad against Tamil Nadu in the Ranji Trophy, the only century in a drawn match. After two matches in 1980-81, he contracted an illness which led to a long period of hospitalization. After recovery, disenchanted with cricket in Hyderabad, he played the 1983-84 season with the Haryana, scoring 256 runs at an average of 20, 32 in six matches, helping Haryana to reach the Ranji Trophy semi-finals. He then retired from cricket at an early age of 23. Saad and his wife Sangeeta now run their eco resort on the banks of the Kabini River in Karnataka. They started their conservation career in Bandipur National Park in Karnataka in 1992, where they still run the Bandipur Cottage. The Jungs owned a wildlife lodge in Bandipur, which is now converted into an eco resort. They moved to Kabini backwaters in 1993. Today, their son, Shaz, who's a renowned wildlife photographer and daughter Zoha Jung run the ecotourism resort with African style ten, uh, tents and local cuisine. The Jungs aim to reconcile the needs of the local people with the needs of conservation through a sustained process of dialogue and trust building, utilization, e uh, utilizing ecotourism as the integral tool for conservation. They, also, they have also been taking safari tours to Africa since 1995. 
Saad has written three books, all with conservation themes. But the first is Wild Tales from the Wild about the people and wildlife of the Mangala Valley in Karnataka. Subhan and I, My Adventure with the Angling Legend of India about angling for Masir uh, in Kaveri River and a novel, Matabili Dawn, which is a thriller set in Africa and India. To hear more, we would like to hear from the man himself. Thank you so much, Saad, for joining us this evening. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Janara. Thank you, Sanjay. And thank you, Rotary, for having me. And especially um, putting us uh, or taking us on a journey, which is, uh, in order to understand which, one has to go back in time. And one has to look at things from a very different perspective if one needs to find solutions to what's happening to wildlife. Our country has been through a lot over the past 70 years, but really, have we learned anything? That's something that I would like all of you to answer um, uh, before we finish today. One of the things about uh, today's discussion, um, I'm afraid, is going to be very India-specific. Um, if anyone has any questions about Africa or any other part of the world, you're more than welcome to raise it or even email me and I'll get back to you with those. I don't think we'll have time today to address the woes of the world. But certainly a journey, a wildlife journey for India, one must partake in, one must understand, and one must comprehend the, the ills of conservation, where we are headed, the beauty of our wildlife, which uh, Sanjay and, and uh, that beautiful tiger that I can see just now. We probably have one of the best wildlife uh, uh, diverse ecobiospheres in the world. Really, we do, right from the Himalayas, which are specific to us and, of course, to our neighbors, coming down to our beaches, coming down to our swamps, coming to our different national parks with varying uh, diversity, uh, animals which have different characteristics in, in different areas, the conflicts that arise in every state which are state-specific and which, uh, unfortunately, don't have solutions. There's a huge amount to discuss in India because India itself is so diverse. And when we look at conflict, um, and conflict is something that we need to look at when we are looking at conservation. Because in order to define conservation, which uh, unfortunately has not been defined in India since 1947, well, I would say conservation disappeared with the British. So it's not a question of placing the entire fault on India for not understanding what conservation is. But I think it's, it's the fault of uh, the past 250 years of our history for excluding, for alienating um, a, a lot of beautiful, local, forgotten people of our country, um, the tribes and the local villagers who live here and who, by the way, are the custodians of our wildlife. So sadly, they've been forgotten. And uh, Sanjay, I think he's he's been around. He's been to BR Hills, which is probably one of the most beautiful national parks today in India. And he knows of the conflicts that are there. So wildlife is beautiful on its own. It's been devastated through the years. Um, but uh, it has its challenges. And these challenges have to be met with all of us today who are here partaking in this, in this debate and the discussion. And even if one of you can lift the pen or can, can lift the phone and, and make a call at the end of the debate and create policy, then we would have won. And, and that is my intention. So when Jahanara came to me and said, um, of course, it came through Sri, who's a, a brother of mine, who's very close to me, and said that I have to do this. I, the moment I heard that it was about conservation, I said, yes, of course, I'll do it. It'll be a pleasure. So what I would like to do today is, uh, considering the, the great uh, limit that we have with time, um, let me go through a presentation with you. And let me start with a journey of uh, the wildlife, of how our wildlife was managed, actually defining wildlife. What is wildlife? Are we wildlife? Because we are animals and uh, we are part of the animal kingdom. The homo sapien is a, a cousin of the gibbon and the ape and the monkeys. I mean, we are 98% uh, given maybe. So um, uh, at what stage in our animal career uh, did we actually digress from being an animal and became human and then called the rest of the animals wildlife. What gave us the authority to do that? Are we really superior? Are we any superior to an elephant herd? 
Are we superior to tigers or, or leopards who, or lions or lion prides or zebras? If I tell you stories about zebras, they are absolutely stunning. And I've studied them in, in the bush. It is so breathtaking that at times you start crying. So how, I mean, who, who, who empowered us to turn around and, you know, at some point in our history, at some point in our past, when we turned around and said, no, 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 we are not wildlife. Oh, we're not even animals. No, we're not. They are animals. And we don't want to be those animals. We are not wildlife. We are humans. Well, sadly, we humans have devastated our environment. We have devastated our wildlife. And we have devastated this world to such an extent, and I read this the other day, and I'm sure all of you already know about this, that the axis of the world itself has changed because we have drawn so much of water from the underground water resources. So a, a lot of destruction is happening as far as this animal is concerned, this animal, the human. Unfortunately, no one is, is seeing what's going to happen or no one's even bothering to look at the solution, especially no one uh, in China or India. And I think we are like 70% of the world population. So what is the difficulty? What is the issue with actually looking at conservation uh, in a manner that even countries like Tanzania and Kenya in, in Africa have done so after their independence, where they've looked internally and they've said, no, we cannot follow these old laws. They are, they are not right for us. Uh, we need to have specific laws for our own wildlife, we need to have specific laws for our own people. And we need to understand that our own people and our wildlife are one. They cannot be um, governed through two different sets of rules. And which is why today, I mean, if there's anyone from Kenya, you will know that even though Kenya has this huge uh, pressure from tourism, at least you're finding solutions or you're looking at finding solutions or in Tanzania or in Botswana or in Zambia or in Namibia or in, or in South Africa. You are... You are on, on, on the path for finding solutions because you've opened your mind to the fact that humans have failed. So let me, let me take you into the presentation straight away. Let me share my screen. And if there's any questions, uh, of course, you're, uh, I don't know how we can do it, but I'm sure there'll be a way that uh, they will find. We will preferably do it at the end. Uh, yeah. We'll ask the participants to raise their hand and then uh, we'll allow them to ask one question each. Okay. So, that's how or they can leave it in the chat box. Yeah, or they can even send it, uh, type it in the chat box. So um, some of the issues that I'll be discussing are sensitive. Please, I do not want to make it political. Please do not make it political. It's not about hatred. It's about understanding and accepting certain ground level realities of India. We are a beautiful nation, but we are a nation with challenges. And these challenges have to be met. And I'm so happy that uh, an organization like the Rotary has actually stepped up and said, Saad, can you come and talk? Because uh, when we do talk, we talk of extremely, extremely sensitive issues. Because unless we discuss the ground level reality of what is happening on the ground, we will never find a win-win solution for all. So let me go straight into my presentation. Um, I'll share my screen and share my sound. Okay. Ladies, can you see it? Is everyone? Yes. Can we someone see it? Done? Yes. yes. All right. Yes. I've got the screen over here. I need to move that. So I don't know what I'm going to do with it. All right. So. So um, I start with trying to define wildlife and the human. What happened? Where, where did we go wrong? Where did we start to say that, you know, we are empowered and we don't want to be associated with uh, the rest of our kin, the rest of our animal species? So I, I, we've done a small presentation. Um, it was uh, used for our lodge, but it just gives you an idea of how beautiful nature really is. <laughs> Thank you. 
that was just to show you that uh, there's water, there's jungles, there's trees, there's fish, there are animals, there's a tiger at the head of the food chain. And what our laws have done is they've taken all this, put them into a certain area and said, we're going to draw a line. And these beautiful environment, this beautiful animals, this all that is why our, why our wilderness is going to be remaining behind this line. And then they called it national parks and sanctuaries. But what they forgot was that on the other side were other animals, which were humans. And till date, India, over 70 years, has never been able to find a win-win solution where everyone wins. And so before, uh, let me now. Are we animals and what is wildlife? Humans are an integral part of the animal kingdom. Every animal that is not domesticated by humans is a wild animal. I mean, isn't that, isn't that a little pathetic? That any animal that is not domesticated by us has been declared by us as a wild animal. It empowered us. It gave us the right to do that because we could kill it. It includes all organisms that grow or live wild in an area without being introduced by humans. So this issue of humans playing God with this absolutely amazing wilderness, without understanding a thing, without having any, any power to create, yet having the power to destroy, yet saying that, you know, I will, I will control who lives and who dies. I will control the carrying capacity of who walks and who doesn't. I will control how many lions there should be or elephants there should be or tigers. Or, and I, I will decide, who are we? So there are some beautiful stories uh, about how some of us, like people like Cynthia Moss, that amazing lady scientist from Kenya, and how she managed to save the elephant population of uh, Kenya from uh, because Kenya wanted to go in for hunting um, and allow ivory export, and how Cynthia Moss really worked really hard with uh, with Leaky in order to stop the culling and in order to allow nature to be. And so I think before I carry on, let me tell you the story. I don't know how many of you know this, but if you read Cynthia Moss's books, you would. Um, Sabo National Park is, a, is, a, is one of the largest national parks in the world. And it is uh, on the eastern side of India, where the, uh, you know, the train, the, the Manitas of Sabo, where all that incident took place. Now, Sabo, in the 70s, the Sabo National Park had about 120,000 elephants. And it was far too much for the sort of uh, uh, forest that it had. So along came the Botswanians and the, Zamb and the Zambians and the South Africans and the Namibians and the Tanzanians and said, you know, you're the, you're the only ones who are fighting against uh, the ivory ban. Why don't you lift the ivory ban and why don't you start culling and your, your forest can only take 45,000 elephants and you've got 120,000. Kill 80,000 of them and take the ivory, sell it, you'll have huge revenue. And then with that revenue, you can plow it back into conservation and you'll be, you'll be a rich country. So um, Leakey, who was at this time the head of the wildlife, Kenyan Wildlife Service, was in two minds as to, oh my God, how am I going to about this? Unfortunately for him, he met uh, Cynthia Moss and she said, listen, uh, Dr. Leakey, please spend two, three days with me in Amboseli. And then I want you to spend just two days with me in Kruger National Park when a culling operation takes place. And because this, is a, this decision that you're going to take is going to affect... Uh, the lives of thousands and thousands of animals, and it'll change the entire structure of that uh, ecobiosphere. So Leaky said, yes, of course, I'll, I'll give, give you that time. Absolutely not a hassle. So when he went to Amboseli, then she took him around. She explained the social hierarchy and the social, um, the beauty of the, of the elephant herd structure and how emotional they are and how they cry and how they feel sorrow and how there's love and how there's 22 months that the female keeps the child in the stomach and we only keep a child in the stomach for nine months and how the mother and child never se separate, how sisters never separate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He was still not convinced. He said, yes, yes, I understand you're a scientist and you're telling me all this, but come on. I mean, you, do you really believe all this? And she said, yes, I do. But hang on, don't take a decision now. Come with me to Kruger. So off they go to Kruger and at Kruger National Park, it's a very long park. So on the Western border of uh, Kruger, she at every 50 kilometers, she went and she placed uh, her, her scientist group. So there were scientists with uh, uh, telephones and walkie-talkies in those days, I think it was. And uh, 
she said, she told the scientists, just report what you see to us and report to us and note it down. And then she took Leaky down to the Crocodile River where there was a culling operation taking place. And uh, she said, you know, what's going to happen is that the helicopter is going to fly and it's going to come in and it's going to herd these entire herd of elephants. And then there'll be a line of uh, white hunters standing and they'll, they'll kill all the elephants. So there'll be no remorse. There'll be, there'll be no social structure. There'll be no higher, damage to the social fabric of um, the elephant population of this country. So Leaky said, okay, fine. Let's see what happens. The helicopter goes up and starts herding these elephants. And within 10, 20 minutes, all along the western border of uh, the western boundary of uh, Kruger National Park, up to 500, 600 kilometers, elephants smash the fence and run for their lives. 500 kilometers away. Every, and, and then the entire elephant herd population, uh, entire population of uh, of Kruger National Park, the entire herd was disturbed by this one helicopter which flew to kill these elephants. So what Cynthia Moss did was she just took the uh, findings of the scientists and just placed it on his table. And he said, now you understand what I'm talking to you about. These elephants talk in infrasound. Infrasound carries 5-10 kilometers. Each elephant herd is telling the other to run for their lives. The flying machines are coming. And you've shattered the, the harmony of this natural park because you want to play God. Leaky went back, said, to hell with it. There will never be culling in Kenya and burned the entire pile, the mound of ivory. Now, these such stories like this are very far and few between because the understanding of the animal, the understanding of what is required for, for and how dynamic nature can be is not there. So then Leaky turned around to, to Cynthia Moss and said, Listen, uh, Dr. Moss, what's going to happen now? There are 120,000 elephants and uh, we don't, they're going to die. So she said, yes, of course they'll die. But they'll die of natural causes. There'll be no trauma. There'll be no, there, there will be no disturbance to the herd. But then you see what happens after that. So over a period of uh, uh, 20 years, they realized that the, uh, the female elephants of uh, Savo changed the estrus pattern. They, they were coming into heat instead of four to five years where a female comes into heat normally, they changed it. They started coming into heat every nine to 10 years. 70, 80,000 elephants died of natural causes. There was regular sorrow, but there was no disturbance. There was no, the, the, there was no trauma. And over a period of time, till date today, the elephant population has settled itself down to 40, 45,000. And, and, you know, it was, we know that nature has, has solutions if we let it be. But will we ever let it be? No, we won't. Did we ever let it be? Yes, we did. We did it when uh, way before the British came. Up till the Mughals and all the amazing Hindu dynasties that we have uh, throughout the history of India, right up till the time that the British came, we allowed nature to be. And what do I mean by that? Uh, So, also the understanding, I'll, I'll get to that as to what happened with the, with the issue of uh, wildlife in the British, but as far as the animal kingdom is concerned, and about us being wildlife, I think what happened was that uh, we were living through, I mean, we, when we were hunter-gatherers, we were living with, uh, with the wilderness, and we were living off it, and I'm sure we, they were also feeding off us. So, uh, there was a huge synchrony, and there was a lot of harmony. And if someone's daughter, like if uh, a tribal girl, lady's daughter or son or wife or husband was taken by a tiger, that community found a solution saying that, listen, this is it's going to happen because we live with them. And therefore, there was it, it was more natural. There was no trauma. But the, the trauma of losing your loved one was there. It was like if any of us, God forbid, lose someone that we really love to an accident, if someone's going to Mysore or Bangalore or driving around or a plane accident, of course, it's going to be trauma. So it was a pretty similar sort of trauma that, that uh, we lived within. And then humans started settling down. Humans started uh, coming up with weapons. We started alienating a lot of wildlife. We became superior. And it's this point of time where we dictated who lived and who died. 
with the rifle, of course, with the weapons that we had, maybe bows and arrows earlier, but certainly with the rifle. And certainly in the 1790s or 1890s, I think it was, when uh, when white, white powder came, when, when the guns turned from black powder to white powder, um, we dictated uh, wildlife. We, we dictated who lived and who died. Because with this uh, nitroglycerin bullet that had come up now, they could place a, a, a round like 200, 300 yards away and they could drop an elephant or a rhino or a lion. So the devastation of wildlife, the, the, the segregation of wildlife as wild animals and humans as humans, I think happened at the time that we started settling down. But the devastation of wildlife had started with nitroglycerin and uh, it continued. And for India, it really became bad in the 1950s because after, the, uh, after India became independent and the royals lost control of uh, gun licensing, and everyone was given a gun, around 70 to 80% of our wildlife was lost then to hunting, to, to uncontrolled hunting. So when did humans stop becoming wildlife? When did, we, when did we say that we're not animals? These are issues that you must ask and you must research for yourself because it's within these uh, debates and discussions that the answer to tomorrow's questions of how to save our wildlife rests because if we are going to reach out and say that, listen, we're going to conserve and we're going to go out there and we're going to be finding a win-win solution for all, that means we have to find a win-win solution for in the, in the area where I live or where Sanjay goes to PR Hills. We have to find a solution for the elephant, for the tiger, for the frog, for the snake, for the leopard, for the human, for the human cat, for the human, the dog that lives in his house, for cattle grazing, for, for the human himself, for his daughter, for his child. Everything, solutions have to be found for everyone because conservation includes a win-win for everyone, for the entire eco-biosphere. We don't do that in India. Unfortunately, what we do is we create a line and we go into a protection mode where we say we have the Wildlife Protection Act. We do have a Forest Conservation Act of sort, but there's no conservation in that. There is nowhere along that path uh, in, in the laws that we have that we actually force the officials to be in dialogue with the local people, to earn the trust of the local people. No, they believe they are God and they remain way above society. There is zero dialogue with the local people. And there is no question that you can protect our wildlife in the porous environment that we live in because all the national park boundaries and sanctuaries are extremely porous. So to answer the question as to who's wild, who's an animal, when did we stop being animals? Are we animals or not? Now, this is something that you will all have to research and come up with. So forest and wildlife management. What happened pre-British, what happened during the British, and what happened post-British? The eras. So pre-British era, literally um, when up to the Mughals, um, and I come from a state uh, of Bhopal and Hyderabad, and we do have documentation, and we have a lot of literature uh, available to us because a lot of books were written by Mysore, by a lot of, a lot of these states. And, and by the way, Mysore was... Uh, one of the places, one of the greatest places, I think, of learning in the world in the, in the 1800s. And in 1882, before anyone even knew about a sanctuary, um, His Highness Mysore came up and said that we are going to declare the Kaveri Wildlife Division uh, a sanctuary. So people said, what in heaven's name is that? And he said, There's, it's a very sensitive area. It's very long. It's very narrow. It's got a huge amount of conflict. There will be no hunting there. There'll be no killing of anything over there. I mean, these rulers were just so amazing. They are, why were they so amazing? Because they had their ears to the ground. Because they turned around and they, when they moved, they moved with the local people. They were not separated by the populace in any way. So they, they actually could feel the heart and throb of their wildlife, of their people, and, and they could then come up with solutions. So pre-British, that was the sort of uh, situation we had where all the villagers and the jungles, which were all integrated and, and intermingled, and of course, the jungles were required because elephants were part of the army. They were extremely important. The jungles were managed by the local people. And forest produce was taken by the local people. And uh, if there was a road had to be built or if a dam had to be built or if anything, a fire divides or whatever, call it whatever, whatever forest management policy that needed to be undertaken, it was undertaken by the local people in conversation with the local people, in dialogue with the Sarpanch. There were no Sarpanches then, but in dialogue with the, with the village heads or with whatever the management system was. 
So the, the, the rulers pre-British were in touch with the ground level realities and were coming up with solutions because the local people themselves were finding the solutions. So as far as conflict was concerned, there was zero conflict because um, the tiger and the elephant and the, and the humans, they all lived hand in hand. So they literally, it was, it was like us driving in Bangalore. We have to just find solutions. And they found solutions. So if a tiger killed a, a boy or a, or a girl, it was just natural and they found solutions to it and, and it was natural remorse. Along come the Brits and they say, no, no, hang on. This, uh, all the forests and the wealth of the forests are uh, a wealth of the crown of England and they need to be harvested. So laws need to come in where we need to exclude anyone from coming in there and we need to stop people from, because now that wood is becoming expensive. They're going to be poaching. There's going to be smuggling. There's going to be killing of animals. So exclude, exclude, exclude. Take out people from here. We don't need anyone coming in. We need to control everything ourselves. And the moment you do that, you start conflict. But the, I mean, no one could raise a voice during uh, any monarchy because uh, the monarchy had a simple way of getting rid of those people who, who would go against them. They just kill them. And, 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 and that goes for all the royals too. So whether it's the British, whether it's the kings of different states of India, that was the thing that you couldn't go against them. But now, so throughout the British era, forests had become this amazing source of wealth for the crown and they were being harvested as such. Exclusionary laws came in. Fine. Then uh, conflict was inherent and conflict was quite rampant, but it was hidden. It was controlled because no one dared raise a finger. Then comes independence. And now through independence, India should have just woken up and said, hang on, why are we following these exclusionary laws? These forests belong to the people of this, uh, of this country. And why, what were the people pre-British doing that we can go back to, which Kenya and Tanzania did, and countries in Africa did. But we chose not to. We didn't change the laws. And Sanjay can, can tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, we made hardly any differences in the exclusionary policies that we followed. And autocratic people came and gave us autocratic laws. So instead of, so when in 1950s and 60s, this, uh, this huge wealth of our wilderness was shot out. It was, by the way, our wilderness was not shot by the, by the Nawabs and the, and the Rajas and Maharajas. 80 to 90% of it was shot in, in the post-independence era when gun licensing was issued in the 1950s and 60s. And when Indira Gandhi comes in, she says, oh my God, what is going on here? How are we going to control it? She reached out to the people next to her. And who were the people next to her? They were autocrats. And uh, the person who gave us the Wildlife Protection Act is a very close friend of mine, but he's royalty and he was an IS officer. So he was very autocratic. And therefore we got a Wildlife Protection Act, which is truly autocratic. Um, there is zero conservation in there. There is zero need for dialogue or building trust with the local people or reaching out to the locals and finding solutions for people. It actually excludes all the local people. And our tribes and the people who really matter to us and who can, who can protect and conserve and, and, and actually take the tiger population from 3,000 today to maybe 8,000 or 10,000 by sharing their lands with the tiger, turned around and said, to hell with you. We don't want the tiger. And so the department, whichever department it was, didn't have an answer to a girl, to a, to a mother who lost a child or, or a girl who lost a father to, an, to a wild animal. Because those answers are gone now with the exclusion. So, so the, the whole issue of conflict then just took on a different uh, massive curve. I mean, it went completely out of control to such an extent that Delhi said, oh my God, we're not going to get into this. Let's shove everything under the carpet. So now Supreme Court steps in, all kinds of things are happening with the tribes and we're trying to do this and trying, but nothing, no, no one till date is saying that dialogue, respect, Conservation is the way forward. Everyone is still hung on, hanging on to the protection. Um, and therefore, let me quickly take you through conflicts before I end. Uh, there are many conflicts in, in our society. And the reason I'm going to talk to you about conflicts is because when you discuss conservation, you take an eco-biosphere as a whole and you find a win-win solution for everyone. That means that you need to get everybody on the table talking to each other and trying to find solutions. But with conflicts, that does not happen. So, so what, what, the, what a lot of our officials have done is they've hidden all these conflicts under something called the man-animal conflict. And they said, no, 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 it's a man-animal conflict. 
It's a man animal conflict, of course, is there, but 99% of the can conflict is between humans itself. And until we understand and comprehend the conflicts within us, these poor animals stand absolutely no chance. So um, understanding conflict is a video. I don't want to show it to you because uh, it will take time. And I think um, I've already covered most of these points. I can send it to you if you, if you require. Um, conflicts. Conflicts can be resolved through inclusionary management. Yes, which is exactly what I was saying. And by inclusionary management, I mean conservation laws. We need laws for conservation. We need laws for dialogue, for building trust, for using all the resources, all the local people at hand that we have, and not just giving uh, God-given powers to a few officials, that doesn't work. Uh, essence of conservation lies in successful conflict resolution. We need to find a win-win solution for all living creatures. We, uh, it's essential to find a win-win platform, trust and respect, effective dialogue amongst all the players. I keep repeating this, but I've spent 40 years in the bush, and I know that this effective dialogue is missing in our country. And, and I really want people like Sanjay and others who are here and who can actually dictate policy to go out there and change these laws. This Wildlife Protection Act that we had should have been a part-time act for about 10 years, leading to a larger conservation act, which didn't happen. So effective tools for conservation. I think the most effective tool for conservation or productive dialogue is hope. Sadly, the people of, our, of these far-flung areas that we have living in our country have even lost hope. I mean, I know of families which used to put stones in the water and feed it to their kids as soup. And when we worked, when my wife and I moved there in the, seven, in the 1980s, um, we realized they had never seen blankets. They had never seen, they, they were still living in the new, the, and they were just bending branches and living under them. And uh, they had never seen forks and spoons and plates and blankets and so when we got all this to, through tourism, and when I started my tourism, they said, oh my God, what are these fantastic things? So they just started taking it, they didn't steal it. I mean, we'd call it as someone else would call it stealing. They just said, no, we, we need it. I mean, we don't have blankets at home. We don't have pillows at home. We don't, we don't have plates at home. We don't have rice at home. We don't have dal at home. What do we do? Let's just take it from Bushpeda, from Saad's place. So what we did was we allowed, we, didn't, we just didn't have any security. We said, no, we don't want security because if someone wants to take something, let him take it. At the end of 10 years, we want that someone who's taking that to become the security for us. And that's exactly what happened. So when we moved into these areas where we work um, and in, uh, in, in uh, BR Hills where Sanjay goes, there's an amazing doctor, one of the most wonderful human beings in the world who does a lot of good conservation work. And the way he does it is he first gives people hope. And then comes revenue. Revenue is not everything. Revenue is part, is a smart, small part and parcel of creating a healthy dialogue towards good conservation. Basic amenities, shelter, clothing, which, which, which was supposed to be given by, uh, it was a democracy, was never given. Health and hygiene was a huge issue in these areas. Education and awareness now is fantastic, but earlier it was missing. Even health and hygiene today in my villages is phenomenal today. Um, that I'm really proud of. Sport. Sp sport as well, why do you need sport in order to break down certain barriers, which I'll discuss in the next page? Vocational training, we should have had huge amounts of vocational training, which is, by the way, there in BR Hills, and it's a fantastic product pro project that they've got. Conflicts, threats to an effective dialogue. Let's look at our country. The I don't even know where to start. Let's say that, let me start from caste divide. What happens with caste divide? There's no point saying we don't have a caste divide. We have a massive caste divide. My manager today, uh, who's been working with me for 40 years, can't go into the homes of 70% of the people in the villages. So if you have this massive caste divide where you can't have them coming over or you talking to them, you're not going to have them sitting on the same table as you. How are you going to have a table where we're going to be discussing a win-win solution for all? It's extremely difficult. And, and a caste divide, no one is working towards breaking that down. Um, the sort of politics that we have, um, that's only fueling this. And uh, it's not the fault of A government or B government. It's been with us since the day we took independence. Caste divide, there's class divide. Class divide now has become an issue because through social media, a lot of these villagers are seeing uh, a lot of uh, wealth 
all over the place and all over the world. And, and they want to, they want part of that wealth now. So, so they're blackmailing, they're, they're doing things which are, which are illegal in order to just get that money, you know, 10,000, 20,000, 1 lakh, 2 lakhs. So, and they, they're doing, going way out of control as far as class divide is concerned. Religious divide, you all know about. For some reason, we believe that, uh, it's, especially in villages, it's not there. I don't see any religious divide in the three areas that I worked in. Um, so over there, it was mainly caste and class. Gender bias, yes, there's huge gender bias, um, which is being overcome. At least government is working towards uh, uh, nullifying gender bias. Now, all these issues are part of conservation. I'm not just telling you this because it creates... All these issues have an impact on conservation in the village. Lack of education, inherent conflict in society, man-animal conflict, conflict with authority. Conflict with authority is huge because the local people believe that the government is corrupt. The government believes that the local people are smugglers and poachers and the twain doesn't meet. And if the twain doesn't meet, where's the dialogue for conservation? So then there's lack of trust, there's lack of respect, there's lack of uh, dialogue, there is zero conservation. So again, you know, um, people with authority, people who can make policy today, these issues have to be understood, accepted, and overcome. And solutions need to be found where we can overcome these. Um, inherent conflicts in rural society, which I've already explained to you, in, especially in our villages, um, all these, everything over here, right from prostitution, adultery, dowry harassment, gender bias, female infanticide, education, uh, alcoholism, all these have become issues which are detriment to conservation because they are a detriment to dialogue. Now, ecotourism is one of the tools which actually takes nothing away from the forest. We take nothing from the forest. We only give and we give and we give back. The only thing that we ask for is a safari where we can go into, a, and, and the animals, by the way, are used to us. They are mating, they're killing, they're doing everything in front. Yes, there is disturbance to it, but there, there is a certain, there is a certain, um, a damage which takes place, but that needs to be understood because every time you drive a car, you're going to be killing wildlife, you're going to be killing ants or insects or reptiles, you're going to be killing those. So, so that needs to be understood. But ecotourism has this immense ability to create dialogue, to earn respect of the local people because we become part of the village and we have to be, otherwise you can't survive there. And we are all, we've also got the government talking to us. So we've got the officials on one hand who's, who, who we have to talk to, otherwise we can't survive. And we've got the villagers and we become the twain that gets them to meet. So ecotourism has huge potential. Uh, unfortunately, uh, especially in our state, unfortunately, tourism is looked extremely negative, uh, negatively and adversely. And we're taking a hit for no, absolutely no fault of ours. Um, then there are various issues. Uh, I'm going to just skip through these that in case someone is looking or, or if you find a youngster who's looking for a way out and who's willing to uh, you know, spend his career in wildlife and in conservation, he can become a guide, he can become a camp manager, he can join photography, um, he, can, he can join equine rescue centers or NGOs, he can do veterinary services, he can become bush pilots in Africa, archaeologists are working in the bush nowadays, they can work in the, in the field of education, bush doctors are needed, are required, and we have amazing people doing amazing work in, in the bush as far as doctors are concerned. And they're all doing it pro bono. Uh, vocational training is a must. So if any of you ever feels the need to do something, set up a vocational training camp. And uh, so there's, there's I, I'm going to end this now. So, um, so I've taken you through a, a short story of our wildlife and our conservation and what we should be looking at what we'll never look at and what needs to be looked at. And for this, I request any of you or all of you who have, who have the reach to go out there and start discussing conservation with our policymakers because we don't need protection. We need conservation. Thank you, Sanjay, and thank you, Rotary. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Asad. It was uh, really wonderful. Uh, I will just, I will straight away open the uh, forum uh, for question. And yeah, uh, over to you, Bharat, you can start. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir, for a great uh, talk. Uh, my question is, at the time of independence, uh, after partition, India had 35 crores and now we have 140 crores. So four times the population, what do you, how do you feel the population is uh, impacted, uh, you know, this whole uh, problem how, how how 
do you feel it you know it makes a difference to this whole uh, topic oh absolutely but you know the way um, that's why i this is this is a debate that always takes place in conservation and that's a great question that's why i brought out the issue of the savo elephants um the population boom in any animal species um the world will find a way out or will ex- that that species will definitely go extinct or it will take a hit but if we if we leave it to natural causes over a period of time things will happen and it might be quite devastating but the thing is that if if we understand that uh, our national parks and our sanctuaries and our reserved areas and our local people and our villagers all have to live in harmony then this population boom which is not really going to affect the already protected areas you know there is no one's entering a protected area anymore so that sanctum sanctum but in order to take your wildlife and grow it from say 3000 elephants to 10000 or take elephants from 10000 to 50000 you will need to then interact with this population boom right now that population boom is not affecting you because uh, it's really not going into any of the protected areas in order to uh, to make a living thank you sir thank you uh, sad i think uh, uh, we have uh, quite a few comments in the chat box uh, you know uh, we have uh, some of them want to read your books as well <laughs> so Uh, how how one can buy your books is it available uh, on amazon oh, amazing it's amazing uh, it's uh, available on amazon uh, what do you what would you like me to address here uh, no i'm just uh, uh, i just wanted to you know you to convey to our audience that the books are available on amazon yes they're all available on amazon uh, you might find it difficult every now and then to to get a couple but write to me if you find i'll, I'll write to the publishers directly sure i will i will definitely share your email id with uh, all the participants here um yeah over to you mona i wanted to ask a question yeah that was a very nice talk uh, mr jan uh, my question is that uh, conservation and protection they both go hand in hand Uh, so i don't understand uh, what you mean when you say that we don't need protection we need conservation that's the first part of my question and secondly if we have to in any manner uh, uh, do something in conservation what is it that we can do because uh, uh, i am a basically a city girl so uh, lady so i am not there in the jungle uh, you know as frequent or i cannot make frequent trips so from here how can i be a part of conservation is my question all right so i'll, I'll answer the first one conservation versus protection as long as you understand that protection is only required when conservation fails Conser- if you don't have a conservation ethos you don't have a conservation law you don't have conservation working within the system within the government systems in india and therefore it's difficult to understand what i'm saying but if you go to any of the african countries uh, where conservation is the heart and soul of the law then wherever conservation wherever that dialogue wherever the win win situation you know trying to find that win win situation fails that's when protection comes in so we we're, we're going to be stopping maybe ivory poaching uh, why is there ivory poaching because we haven't been able to give uh, ample revenue to the local villages why haven't we been able to give ample revenue to the local villages because of this because of this because of this so finally if you don't have solutions then you require protection but if you have actually addressed the issue of conservation addressed the issue of finding a solution then uh, conservation and protection are extremely different protection is through a gun conservation is through dialogue and respect about conservation is through create taking everyone along with you all the people who are involved in that eco biosphere mm-hmm. the officials and the locals and and us and everyone that is involved and the wild animals and the feral animals and our our own uh, animals and protection is only about the wildlife drawing a line and saying cross this and i'll shoot you but my animals can cross these these lines and they can come and eat your child or the elephant can come and eat your crop but if you touch them i'll put you in jail so they're very two different issues as far as you 
being part of conservation. Ma'am, please understand that conservation is required in your own city, in your own village, in your own lane. Uh, there are dogs, there are cats, there are humans, there are village, there are poor, there are there's just so much happening, and especially in, in, a, in a city. There are slums, there are huge amount of local people, there are NGOs who are part of it. So if you can't come out into the into the bush or if you can't come out to the villages, just look around you. Within locally, you'll find so much happening because conservation is not just wildlife based. Conservation is in, in every little patch of our country. It needs to be conserved. India needs to be conserved. Bangalore needs to be conserved. Indranagar needs to be conserved. Everything needs to be conserved through dialogue. So, uh, uh, there's one question from Mahendra Jain in the chat box. Uh, he asks, any views on our uh, Kuno Chita project? Would you like to answer that? Kuno Chita project is a fantastic project. Again, Again if it was, if it was uh, based on an assumption that we are going to conserve the area and in this conservation biosphere, we are going to leave this Chita. Because the cheetah are known to move a thousand kilometers. Well, in Namibia, they move a thousand kilometers, but maybe in the Serengeti, they move 600 kilometers. In Kuno, they could be moving two, 300 kilometers. Now, if you haven't actually got a solution within those two, 300 kilometers, if you haven't spoken to the villagers in those two, 300 kilometers, that uh, chaps, we are putting in cheetah here and we want you to be, and if there's any issue with your, with your goats or with your dogs, we will compensate you. Um, they're not a threat to your children. They're not a threat to humans. But if that's the only thing that they can do is they can probably feed off your um, of your goat or your or your dog. We will compensate you. Please become part of this. And if you were in dialogue with those people around two three hundred kilometers, then Kuno would be a magnificent project. And the reason why I was for it was because the PMO was involved. And wherever PMOs are involved, they're always looking at the larger picture because they don't want the project to fail. So I don't really know whether the, the whole conservation thing has happened in Kuno. If it hasn't happened, it's a disaster. If it has happened, I'm all for it. And I, I believe it's good for our country. Yeah, I uh, hope. Uh, yeah, any, anyone else uh, want to ask any questions? Uh, you have uh, quite a lot of friends in our uh, group, uh, Mrs. Sat. I think uh, Paddy is uh, wishing you on the chat box and Vijay Mane says, nice to have you here. And <laughs> so, Hi guys, I'm sorry. I, I'm not even looking at the chat. But if there's anything <laughs> you need, just reach out to me. Uh, Sanjay's got my number, just call me. Yeah. Hi Saad, good evening. This is Vijay Mane here. Nice to meet you a lot earlier. Yeah, of course. Yeah, especially. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, reason, uh, uh, quick one. I mean, there's much you already explained. I'm talking about this urban wildlife production, uh, what's happening, especially in the Whitefield and Brookfield area. There are a lot of, uh, you know, oh, hello. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. We can hear you, Vijay. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, these snakes, especially the Russell Vipers and the Cobras and all that. So far, I've managed to rescue close to about 25 plus uh, these uh, uh, lovely creatures because we have encroached into the area uh, where all the fields used to be now all become concrete jungles. We have managed to get a lot of these uh, volunteer snake catchers. Uh, they come, but there are a lot of people who come up now who keep demanding 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 bucks. Is there some kind of a control measure for that? Because uh, you know, one gets scared of the snakes, but with that uh, anxiousness or eagerness, they just land up paying. So we have these uh, numbers from BBMP forest and all that, but still the time they reach is not enough. I think so Vijay, the, the, of it. the thing to do is to convert it into a revenue center. Um, just look into it and uh, reach out to a Khan or Sanjay can help you. Just reach out to a couple of people and see how and what is the sort of investment that is required. And maybe you can get the community or maybe you can do it yourself because it is extremely uh, revenue uh, generating. You can actually catch these snakes, put them in a farm and uh, generate revenue from them. Because remember, when they're being translocated, they're going to be a problem there too, unless they're going to be taken into the middle of a national park, which I don't think is happening. So um, I, I think we need to look at, uh, uh, look at it positively. 
Of course, the fear it kills. Yeah, the snake kills. Sir, it. what we have done so far is we have taken them and put them in uh, you know this opposite IDPL. There is a forest research center. We left them there, and some we have left them in uh, Banagada National Park. They'll come out, no, Vijay. Uh, but yes. Banagada National Park, at least you know some kind of a national park kind of a thing. So at least we are kind of you know they they do come out, no doubt about it. My worry is, is there a way in which uh, you know we can uh, increase more of these uh, government. driven uh, snake rescuers than you know these private guys who keep uh, demanding more money no, I, no of course you can yeah of course you can you can speak to the tribes you can speak to uh, i think i would just pick up the phone and speak to romulus romulus yeah. vinegar's team it's, it's an amazing productive positive thinking team and i think we also have the in darwar as a place where we have it the snake rescue center uh, i forget the name where we have the king cobra uh, rehabilitation center you can reach out to them um the best is to get uh, to to find some sort of revenue coming out of it uh if you can't find revenue then then maybe it's best to get the irulas or one of these tribes to come in and just just station themselves there if it's such a big problem yeah thanks uh, thanks mr sir there's one question in the chat box my friend connie callen i guess a uh, member from trinidad and tobago I'm not sure uh this question is uh, how can we in rotary start uh, locally part uh, how can we in rotary start local see that uh, participate to support your work so i think i think the thing to do is to um just reach out to sanjay uh, so basically and, they are asking how we can uh, make the locals participate in this particular so oh, i think you need to look at it differently you need to you need to look at it uh, you need to look at conservation in your own area and the huge reach that rotary has you can look at conservation you can break it down into policy making into ground field work into revenue centers and once you and even in schools you know you can come up with conservation plans and programs uh, or or in villages you can come up with plans and programs where you can go ahead and and start educating them you can do vocational training centers through rotary which are absolutely essential uh, vocational training centers especially in far flung areas you should look at that and you can structure it through through your own groups so um, even if you need to fund it sitting in trinidad tobago you can do it through rotary bangalore or you can just reach out to your own trinidad conservation efforts over there and because their people will need uh, conservation over there too so one is policy i think certainly you lot in the rotary should look at uh, changing our policy and speaking to judges and speaking to people of the higher upper upper echelons of our political system and our bureaucracy and then you should look at ground level reality as to how to actually come in and make a difference I think we lost you for a minute. Uh, uh, where, Sanjay? The no. last part. The last part. Oh, the last part was uh, you should. Uh, it's it's a two pronged attack that I think Rotary should look at or any Rotarian should look at. You must accept the the huge power that you have in your hand of a reach. You can reach uh, bureaucrats. You can reach politicians. So attack it in a, in a manner where you can create policy with these people. Maybe change policy. and on the other hand you can use your rotarian power and the reach to get to villages to get your vocational training centers and get your awareness programs into schools also uh, supporting local schools uh, like uh, he's got a problem in whitefield with snake catching we could actually come up with a program for schools uh, where we can get a snake catcher who can take children across and it it can actually become a productive uh, exercise instead of it becoming staying negative so you have such a huge reach available to you through your rotary organizations in mysore and i'm sure and they're there in literally every uh, township in india that uh, you can then reach out to these far flung areas and make a difference through this organization itself thank you um, in fact our endeavor is to connect rotary and you know wildlife we, we would like to uh, be a bridge between the two uh, things you know we, we want to take service Uh, we want to extend the rotary service to wildlife conservation as well that's the idea with which uh, we have started this particular group i'm sure uh, in the coming years we will be uh, doing that uh, arsha says beautiful talk but he also wants to know 
what motivates you to carry on uh, with your conservation journey Arshay, i was playing cricket and I, I i whatever fame i saw as an 18 year old at 19 i was told i had 3 months to live and i had cancer and then that was a two and a half year fight in 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 the hospital and at the end of which i said that's it i'm not going to do anything for fame or money or power i'm just going to go there and dedicate my life to these people and they are so beautiful, our villagers. They are just the most beautiful people in the world. And my wife and I have dedicated our lives to that ever since. That's so nice. Really inspiring. Uh, yeah, Mr. Kiran, um, you know, who has a tiger photo behind him, he wants to know uh, if uh, any work at Kabini to reduce lens charges since you have a resort. <laughs> Yes. Come, we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you see, number two, uh, you know, what concerned is about what you call the metis, you know, their monotonous job. Uh, the, those who go, go for round, you know, for beating. Beat, beat people are a metis, what you call. Yes. What about uh, it? their monotonous job? You know, has uh, has create sometimes uh, they are not tourist friendly, or uh, you know, even if they cite something, they don't part with the drivers or something like that. Not tourist friendly. Any any work is going on that. So I think you're talking about the guards and the watchers and the foresters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So the guards and the and the foresters are the, as far as I'm concerned, the gods of our forest. They are, they are the most amazing set of people who have so true, far true. protected our wilderness. They are the ones that we should be actually hugging every day. And what do we do? We relegate them. Their salaries are horrible. They're, they're on, not on international uh, power at all. Their salaries need to be like tripled, if not, if not quadrupled. And they need, to be, they need to be worshipped by the department itself. Instead, what do we do? We have a structure which is completely different. We have many PCCFs, we have millions of CCFs, we have DCFs, we have everyone on top who's going to, who's, whose ears are not even attuned to ground level reality. These guards, these watchers, they know every single household what is happening in our forest and around the forest. You need to increase their capacity. We need to increase the respect and the, and the revenue that goes into that. We need to give them all the basic amenities that you can because they are looking after wealth which is in crores and crores. Uh, we don't do that, sadly. Uh, our our governments in India just don't seem to just don't seem to want to respect these people who work below them. And that's something that uh, Rotary should definitely look at working with the senior forest officials. Increase their pay. That's conservation. Increase the their habitat where they live. That's conservation. And just make them make them uh, happier people. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You reminded me the Farooq engineer also. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a... Uh, I think, uh, Saad, I'm going to reach out to you uh, on this regarding supporting the forest staff. We are already you know, uh, planning something. I will... Uh, we would like to make it more sustainable. I will definitely reach out to you on that. Uh, and you. please go ahead. Uh, Anne Frisch, you want to ask something? Please go ahead. Uh, good morning from Minnesota. Well, I, I was particularly impressed by the uh, the chart about why we can't get to negotiation. I mean, it looks really, really difficult. Um, but probably some of these factors are more um, difficult than others in, in a given situation. I think there should be no barrier to addressing these issues of protecting wildlife and rotary because the issue is basically a human conflict. And there are organizations working on the rights of animals, <clears throat> but it's all in human courts. The rights of nature is a group that could really be helpful to people. Um, on, on this regard, we have rights of water streams and lakes now, and uh, rights of <clears throat> laboratory animals, the rights of uh, wildlife. 
Uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential here. This is basically a human issue. Moreover, Rotary, the Rotary Action Group for Peace now has a course ongoing right now. We'll continue on ending uh, <coughs> human wars. Uh, <coughs> and it's, it's very interesting. I will put my name in the chat if anybody's interested, but there's much to be learned about this because essentially these conflicts over wildlife are basically human wars. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also one of the reasons why, why I'm here is because of Rotary. And I believe otherwise I, I don't really work with a lot of NGOs because I think there's a huge amount of corruption within the NGO system, like you're saying, human failures. And uh, Rotary has proven over time that uh, it's not corrupt. So whatever happens actually will. So if so, if, even if I put in some money into an organization, into a project that you're doing, I know it'll go to the right people. Uh, I'm a little worried about saying the same thing about NGOs in India, but I'm sure it's not the same in America. I'm sure you people are doing a fantastic job. Uh, thanks for that pat on our back, uh, uh, Mr. Saad. Uh, yeah, we would. That's that's one reason why we want to encourage Rotary clubs to take up uh, projects, uh, wildlife conservation projects, to ensure that you know the hundred percent. Uh, contribution that we raise goes actually for actual conservation. There's no administ hardly any administrative costs involved. So basically in Rotary, we spend our money to spend others' money. That's exactly what we are doing. So that's something, you know, uh, uh, thank you. The, your words are really encouraging. There's one question. Uh, Rajat Ghosh is asking, is there a government program where I can get involved in policy making? Um, okay, I think uh, uh, after this question, maybe we'll take one or two maximum. Then we will uh, close. It. I think I, I think uh, I think you know, Rajat, as well as uh, I think literally everyone on this on this chat, that uh, policy in India is made uh, uh, over a drink in the evening in someone's room, you know, over a party or in a getting together of of like-minded people, whether it's a politician or a bureaucrat. It's that caucus of people that meets and creates it. So you've got to, there is no such thing as, as a policy making. Uh, of course, there is. Uh, every government has that. But the effective way of actually dealing with policy making is going to the power center and uh, creating dialogue, effective dialogue with the power center who has the ability to make a decision. Talking to others doesn't really matter. Uh, in, in India. You, you've got to go right to where the bureaucracy and the, politician, the political powers are and do your work with them. Thank you. Do you think, uh, so this is Shams Khan, he wants to, do you think uh, farmers around the forest should be motivated to uh, to get into ecotourism rather than sticking to traditional farming? What a fantastic question. And look at this draconian, horrendous act that we have in India called the eco-sensitive biosphere. So that eco-sensitive zone that we have, it actually prohibits any farmer, any local man from setting up a, a homestay, from setting up an eco-sensitive, eco-tourism eco zone, an uh, eco-tourism lodge or a camp or a tented camp. It makes it so difficult for him to enter uh, that he can't even think, or he can't even perceive it. And you hit it on the head. If farmers open their houses to homestays, can you imagine the sort of experience that our tourists will have? It's phenomenal. Thank you for asking that. That is conservation. That is taking awareness and revenue. And when, they, when these farmers who live in these very sensitive areas, when they meet people from all over the world, even they start uh, thinking differently, you know, even they start thinking positively towards the tiger or the elephant. Because right now, if I go to someone in the village and say, you know, that that tiger has killed your, your child, please, let's conserve it or let's protect it. She'll ask me to get lost. She'll throw me out of the village. So that's a fantastic answer. We need to work towards that. But then again, that's a policy that government of India made. 15 kilometers, you can't do any commercial development. I mean, that's absolute rubbish. But Saad, uh, the other side of it is, uh, okay, um, when we uh, take a place like Chikmagalur, Mullayangiri, today Mullayangiri uh, 
around that area. Uh, a lot of homestays have mushroomed and, you know, the amount of traffic that gets into that place, you know, on a, on a weekend or a, a general holiday, we can't even think of, you know, even human beings can't think of going there. Uh, what happens to the uh, wildlife there? Does it not get, you know, disturbed because of this heavy movement? Because everybody is doing the same thing or a lot of them are doing the same thing. I mean, at least, uh, Sanjay, as far as our national parks are sanctuaries are concerned, uh, at least Karnataka has worked on a carrying capacity. Uh, how, however, that formula was arrived at. Um, and the Supreme Court has come up with uh, their own calculation of 20% of, of a protected area to be given to tourism. So 80% of any protected area in any case is clear, is free from tourism. So the, em the emphasis that you're talking about, the pressure that is coming, is coming only on that 20%. And if you've noticed which is really uh, an amazing thing. Animals prefer humans. Animals prefer humans because they find safety in numbers. So if you go to Bandipur or go to Kabini or BR Hills or go to Chikma, anywhere you go, around human settlements, you will find animals where there's no poaching, of course, where the systems have, conservation systems have worked and, and there's no poaching. So I don't think you should worry about footfall uh, in, into that tourism zone, that 20% tourism zone. Leave that to the animals to decide, and you will find that they don't mind it. But uh, also, the, the other advantage that we have in Karnataka is that we have a carrying capacity. So only that many buses, only that many vehicles can go in. So apart from the, the, the pressure that you have on the main roads and uh, the pressure that you have of, of garbage, et cetera, et cetera, of a lot of people moving, that I think the government needs to accept and come up with uh, management policies, which are far more effective and better. So that they need to do, and government has solutions to that. So it's it's a. I wouldn't be too worried about a footfall increasing. And in any case, if footfall realizes, people realize the place is overcrowded, they'll stop going. So over a period of time, it'll work itself out. So what you're saying is it should be regulated than restricted. It's automatic. It's already got regulated, Sanjay. Yeah. So uh, regulation and restriction is already in place. So now the only pressure that you're finding it, the, you're finding is in a. Maybe in uh, in non-protected areas, like outside the forest, uh, you're finding a problem. And that, regulating that, to regulate that, I think the eco-sensitive zone came. But the system is so corrupt that, that eco ESZ has become draconian instead of being productive. So if, if you were to talk to officials, you could probably get them to understand that the, the system will not work if there is corruption in the system. So eco-sensitive zone right now is working against uh, the ecology because it's creating conflict. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Saad. Thank you for your patience and uh, really glad uh, that we have uh, uh, we had you here. Uh, and uh, of course, you uh, told us how laws have constantly excluded uh, local people. That is something, you know, it's an eye-opener for me also. Uh, it, it's very important to for the laws to you know uh, uh, we should be it should be made more inclusive. Uh, this is not uh, uh, the right way of dealing with things. And uh, yeah, you stressed uh, very much on dialogue, importance of dialogue. I'm I'm really glad, and we learned a lot uh, from this session. And thank you all for joining uh, and uh, for your uh, patient hearing um, and for your uh, great questions. We were uh, able to get some very nice answers and I'm sure uh, this is just a beginning of our journey. We will uh, have more of uh, such sessions, dialogues in future and see what best we can do for wildlife conservation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sajjan. And also thank you, Jahanara, for uh, uh, bringing uh, Mr. Saad here. Um, uh, we will sure uh, there are some comments about your resort as well. People have said we have come and stayed there. It's a very beautiful place. I have been to Kabini many times. I haven't been there yet, but I will definitely uh, visit uh, sometime uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank, thank you, Mr. everyone. Saad. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.